today. Uh, today I'm going to speak about uh, some unpublished work from my uh, from my postdoc that I was doing in Stockholm, where I've been using human stem cells to derive uh, posterior axial tissue. So I'm sure everyone here is familiar with this kind of schematic uh, that depicts the use of human embryonic stem cells or human induced pluripotent stem cells in deriving the three major germ layers of the body, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Uh, but it turns out that these three classifications can also be further subdivided according to where they originated in the body plan. So did they originate from an anterior source or a posterior source? So what do I mean by that? I'm actually going to start uh, by describing a 2007 paper from, uh, from a cancer group. Now this, this group were actually searching for promoters that could drive expression in the posterior colon because they wanted to model uh, colorectal cancer. And in their search, they found a fragment of the CDX2 promoter. And when they used this fragment to drive beta-gal expression, they found that uh, cells were labeled in the posterior tip of the developing embryo. But then when they instead used the same promoter to drive a CRE and a LOXP stop like Z background, they found that they had now permanently labeled uh, many cells in the posterior half of the, of the embryo. Uh, and in this dorsal view, you can see quite clearly that while the uh, um, forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain were never labeled. Starting at about this limb level, you could see labeling of uh, the posterior spinal cord and its adjacent lateral neural crest cells. Then when this group uh, looked more at internal organs, they found the same pattern. So for example, uh, endodermal organs such as the stomach and the duodenum, which are more anterior, these organs were not labeled but the posterior endodermal organs of the cecum and the colon were. And then regarding mesoderm, anterior heart muscle was not labeled. Uh, muscle from the forelimb here was also not labeled, but posterior mesoderm tissues such as the kidney were labeled or in the, the Semitic muscle in the hind limb. And uh, this pattern across these three germ layers whereby anterior structures were not labeled, but posterior structures were labeled from this CDX2 transgene, actually reflects two different phases in embryogenesis uh, by which the, the embryo builds itself during development. So if I may uh, do a bit of a crash course on gastrulation. So gastrulation begins uh, with the breaking of symmetry uh, and the emergence of uh, mesendodermal progenitors at the posterior tip of the embryo. Here, these progenitors undergo an EMT and uh, migrate underneath the overlying epiblast uh, and forward to create future heart tissue. Uh, above that, the anterior neural plate will start specifying to become the forebrain, and at the border of the plate will uh, emerge anterior neural crest cells. Uh, but over time, these endodermal progenitors undergo a state change, and they, they start upregulating CDX2, and they uh, participate in the building of what's sometimes referred to as the caudal growth zone. Now, the caudal growth zone is a very proliferative uh, part of the embryo. The daughter cells from this zone slot into the more anterior body tissues. And as this proliferation increases over time and generates more and more daughter cells, the caudal growth zone is uh, displaced posteriorly. And when you look at it in this way, you can start to appreciate that uh, these anterior structures, such as the heart and the forebrain, they were derived uh, through early events in gastrulation, but more uh, posterior structures uh, have been derived later in time from this caudal growth zone. And this is sometimes referred to as the cranial versus the postcranial body axis. Uh, and these daughter cells from the caudal growth zone, they can slot into many different tissues in the elongating embryo. Uh, so medially, they will slot into the, the preneural tube, or their more lateral preneural crest. Uh, they can also undergo an EMT and slot into the uh, underlying pre-Semitic mesoderm or at the most uh, lateral part of the embryo derived lateral plate mesoderm. Now, obviously this is a, a huge field and there are thousands of papers on, on these uh, processes. And uh, here I've, I've simply put some of the, the papers uh, that have been uh, crucial for, for me to help understand this process. 
Okay, so if we then put this, these uh, decisions into a very simplified tree, uh, this might be what it looks like. And, and this kind of tree I find really useful in understanding the, the different nature of the cranial versus the postcranial body axis. So for example, one can see that the anterior neural plate is one of the first uh, structures in the neural tube to be derived from the epiblast. But by contrast, uh, neural progenitors in the spinal cord have undergone a completely different journey. So for them, epiblast cells first transitioned to mesendodermal progenitors. These then transitioned to progenitors in the caudal growth zone. Now, the caudal growth zone is at this moment in time, uh, a very poorly understood mixture of multiple progenitor pools uh, that might derive uh, midline structures such as, such as the nodal cord or lateral structures in the lateral plate mesoderm. But the progenitor pool that I uh, have been focused on in my postdoc in the Headland Laboratory have been this pool called uh, neuromesodermal progenitors. They're called neuromesodermal progenitors because they derive both the neural tissue and the semitic tissue. And here I might do a bit of a segue to the Headland Lab. So uh, this is us. Uh, at, uh, Ava is now located at uh, Stockholm University. Here is, here is my supervisor, Ava. And uh, in the lab, actually, most people uh, work on motor neuron disease. They work on, on ALS, and, and there's a lot of work going on using uh, uh, patient tissue and, and iPSCs harboring ALS mutations. Uh, and here, the Headland Lab uh, tries to understand mechanisms that might be responsible for the degeneration of this connection between uh, spinal cord motor neurons and their peripheral muscles. So when I first arrived uh, in Ava's lab, we spoke a lot about how uh, in vitro models of ALS uh, could benefit a lot by patterning tissues to these more posterior axial levels, rather than at the time, a lot of uh, protocols that would uh, instead derive uh, motor neurons from more anterior levels. So this, uh, this became my project to try and, and uh, reproduce this decision tree using stem cells in a dish. Now, this, uh, this field is actually a very rich field and a, a lot of good work has been done, uh, especially in, in the last uh, five to 10 years. And it's clear now that a mesendodermal intermediate is not necessarily uh, required to derive the lineage tree of neuromesodermal progenitors. And uh, here uh, beside uh, the NMPs, I've written some of the labs that have uh, made uh, important contributions to, to building these protocols. And then there are, there are other labs that have uh, focused on using in vitro NMPs to derive, uh, for example, pre-Semitic mesoderm, pre-neural crest, or, or the pre-neural tube. And the pre-neural tube is a, is a particularly uh, popular one. But what uh, Ava and I, uh, noticed was that despite all of these protocols in the literature, uh, there was no one unified protocol. And by that, I mean a protocol where the NMPs that you derive have the capacity to generate all three of these lineages uh, at high efficiency. So this, uh, this became my, my task. Uh, and uh, because uh, Ava's lab is interested in ALS, we had a particular interest in also patterning neural progenitors to be either from the ventral neural tube, which would contain the motor neural progenitors, as well as the dorsal, uh, the dorsal neural progenitors. So I've been working on this for a number of years now, and, and I think I've made some progress. Uh, I won't go into all of the details of, of the protocols, but uh, just briefly, we found, like other labs have found, that WINT and FGF were required to uh, generate our NMPs. And here you can see a staining for three transcription factors. SOX2 is a neural transcription factor, Brachyuri is a mesodermal transcription factor, and when they are both present in uh, these cells, it confers them the bipotency to derive both the mesodermal lineages and the neural lineages. And then CDX2 is an important one because uh, it would uh, confer the ability to upregulate Hox genes, for example. From these NMPs, we can then modulate wind signaling and derive uh, TBX6 positive pre-Semitic mesoderm cells. Uh, alternatively, we can use BMP to derive pre-neural crest cells. Uh, and in this staining, you can see three neural crest transcription factors, TFAP2A, PAX3, and SOX9. Uh, they're not always co-expressed, uh, but there's a, definitely a high proportion of them. 
We can drive the sonic hedgehog signaling pathway to ventralize uh, uh, neural progenitors. Here you see the motor neuron progenitor marker OLIG2, another ventral marker NKX2.2, or the floor plate marker FOXA2. And then finally, we found that we could use uh, BMP to derive dorsal neural progenitors. Uh, here we use a late pulse of BMP, and you can see that most all the progenitors are co-expressing PAX3 and MSX, and a portion of them are also expressing OLIG3. So uh, this took a number of years to, to put together, but uh, we're, we're really happy with that result. And uh, now that we have these monolayer protocols to derive these lineages, uh, the next step I took was to try and experiment with uh, 3D culture conditions. Uh, so in this schematic, you can show, uh, this schematic shows how I've derived the individual monolayers of the different lineages. I'll then take a monolayer and dissociate it uh, and put the cells in a U-bottom well so they aggregate into a sphere. So this would be a sphere of the pre-Semitic mesoderm differentiation or the neural crest or the, the ventral and dorsal neural tube. After these spheres have formed, we then simply place these spheres uh, next to one another. The spheres then fuse, and, and this is what it, what it looks like. Um, now, we're not sure exactly what to call these things, so this is a work in progress, but at least for today, I'm going to call these things PAXs for posterior axial assembloids. Now, if uh, in cases where we use an uh, IPS line that has a GFP under the control of a motor neuron transcription factor, HP9, we can see that we get a, a large number of motor neurons uh, expressed in this uh, ventral uh, component of the assembloid. And we call them axial because uh, if you section these assembloids and stain for Hox uh, proteins, we see that there is very uh, robust expression of Hox C9, which is uh, expressed at the thoracic level. So these assembloids have definitely come from the, the posterior body axis and not the cranial axis. So at, at 10 days, we then started staining for uh, the markers that we would expect to see in the different components. And, and here it's, it's once again, this uh, HB9 GFP line, but I've added it on top in the same channel, uh, HUCD to stain all of the neurons. Here you'll have the motor neurons that are particularly green and you find some other neurons uh, up in this compartment. This compartment also has a lot of SOX10 positive neural crest cells. And then uh, in this compartment in the bottom right, we see expression of a pre-Semitic mesoderm marker, PAX3. So that's at, at 10 days. We can uh, grow these assembloids for, for many weeks after that. This is a, an example of a 50-day assembloid. Uh, it's still a bit early days, so we're, we're currently processing this tissue uh, to see what's in these assembloids. And uh, here I'm very grateful for some uh, help from Melanie, a postdoc in the lab, and, and Sylvia, a PhD in the lab. And they have been working hard to uh, do immunos on this, on this tissue. And we've been very happy to see uh, islet one positive motor neurons surrounded by uh, many TUT1 positive neuronal projections. We also see lots of astrocytic markers uh, in, this, in these assembloids. And we were very, very happy to see uh, these three muscle markers. So Titan is a protein that's involved in the contractile machinery uh, of a myofiber. And when one sees Titan in this striated fashion along a con uh, fused myotube, it's a very good sign that the, these fibers uh, could be functional. And then we also see uh, expression of these uh, satellite marker transcription factors, PAC7, or um, important uh, transcription factor for muscle differentiation, MyoD. Uh, and then around 50 days, we were also very excited to see that our assemblies actually moved. And I'm going to play you a, a video of that now. The movement is uh, a bit subtle, so watch closely. Uh, and this, this will uh, be a loop over uh, a single movement. Well, So what we think we're seeing here, or at least what we hope that we might be seeing here, is uh, functional contractions of this, this muscle tissue that, that has been derived in these uh, paxes. 
these, sponta these contractions are spontaneous. We don't have to add anything to the, to the media for them to happen. We first observed them around day 45 or 50. We have seen them in every Paxa that we have ever brought out to this, uh, this age. Uh, and we actually find, for me, it was interesting. So these, these contractions, they're, they're different to some other muscle contractions that you might have seen. So if anyone has seen contracting car embryonic cardiomyocytes, uh, these myocytes contract in waves that sort of uh, repeat one after another. But that's not the pattern that we see with, uh, with these contractions. So uh, this is a, a quantification done by another PhD in the lab, Uren. So she, she's taking these videos and at every frame she is uh, producing a mask to identify uh, the, the uh, paxa versus the background. She then measures the area of the paxa and then she measures the delta of that area compared to the frame before. Uh, and with this analysis, uh, these spikes here are corresponding to moments in the video when the, the paxa contracts. And so we see that the, the contraction is uh, quite constant uh, over this whole 10 minute time period. So, you know, just to, uh, to take a step back, you know, out in the literature, there are, there are already many very good 3D models that generate posterior tissue. Uh, and here I, I've just, uh, you know, detailed some of the, the more impressive ones. I'll also point out that um, this, study here from uh, Mina Guti's lab, it, it's a really nice study and they're, they're generating uh, organoids that also contain uh, neural tissue and uh, contractile muscle. But, uh, and then th these uh, other models also, you know, contain impressive aspects of, of self-emergence, of, of patterning and self-organization, and certainly our axes don't, uh, our paxes don't have that. But one aspect which I'm hoping our paxes bring to the table is that they're modular. So in the examples I've shown you already, uh, all of the cells were derived from a single cell line. But uh, in principle, you could derive different compartments from different cell lines. So for example, you could derive the muscle compartment from an IPS line harboring an ALS causative mutation and try and dissect you know, cell type specific contributions to disease phenotypes. Or alternatively, you could derive just the ventral component of the neural tube uh, from a cell line harboring a channel rhodopsin uh, to uh, allow you to optog optogenetically uh, activate those cells. Uh, and the list goes on and on. And uh, while, while this is probably the end of, of my uh, study in the Head and Lab, certainly moving forward, uh, once you have a PAXI, you can throw the kitchen sink at it. So any sort of uh, transcriptomics, spatial or single cell disease modeling, like I mentioned, uh, CRISPR screening or, or, or drug screening. Uh, so this is certainly the, the direction that the Head and Lab wants to go. And finally, I'd, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, everyone in the Head and Lab, especially uh, my, my supervisor, Ava. Um, this is uh, Melanie and Sylvia, and then this is Eden over here who have been helping me a lot in this final stage. Uh, we have also uh, had good collaborations with the Lalamont Lab who are helping us with some RNA scope that I didn't show. Uh, the Ericsson Lab have been letting me come and raid the antibody bank, uh, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, Samir and Daniel have, are now helping us with some uh, RNA sequencing, which I also didn't have uh, time to mention. And we've been uh, gifted some antibodies from the Birchmeyer lab, which have been helpful. And also a uh, big thanks to all the funders. Uh, Yen Funden and SSFF played my postdoc stipend and uh, Orlen Stiftelson have uh, been very generous in their support for this project. And with that, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>